Welcome everybody to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, today I'm gonna be joined by Matt Frazier, uh, who everybody that's used to watching these streams is aware of and, and has been on here before. Uh, and we're also gonna have guest Suzette Allen, who's one of our Lumix ambassadors, to talk about a wide variety of topics from the Lumix S series and G series of cameras. Uh, basically, you know, to kind of cover some of the technical reasons why you know, you may want to choose one over the other, and some reasons why having both in your kit may be advantageous for you. Uh, we're also going to be addressing some of the features that were released in the S1H version 2.0 firmware. Uh, since we've gotten a lot of questions and comments around either our social media, but then also on a number of the different groups online, uh, we're primarily going to be talking about monitoring with the 6K, 5.4K, and 5.9K modes over to HDMI, since we now added the downscaling for that. Uh, the V-Log uh, uh, noise reduction update, which brought negative one for noise reduction. And we'll also touch a bit on, on the uh, delay of the raw update over HDMI uh, with some information for you guys about that. So like we said, uh, a little bit later, Suzette Allen will be joining us uh, to, to also be discussing the new Lumix 20 to 60 millimeter lens that was just released the other day. Uh, and we're gonna have her provide uh, you know, some thoughts on what she enjoyed about shooting with the lens in the project that she did for creating uh, um, sample images for us with um, that lens. As always, if you have questions, please make sure to drop them down in the uh, chat section uh, with the tag at Lumix cameras so that we can see them and so Jack Salamanchek who is uh, one of our support reps in the US uh, can monitor it answer questions that are really quick and easy to do but then also be able to shoot them over to us so that we can uh, you know get you guys some answers uh, with that we would be bringing in Matt Frazier at the moment right now, but it looks as though we have a little bit of a technical issue with some of the streaming uh, systems going on. Uh, as you can tell here, I am in a new location for streaming, uh, just moving apartments. So between the new internet setup, resetting up the streaming kit, and also working with a number of people out in uh, different parts of the country, um, getting everyone connected is always a little bit of a, challenge sometimes, but it looks like he's coming back in right now. So we'll give that another second. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for, for taking time to uh, join us today. And what I'm going to do is actually, while we're waiting for that video to come up, uh, let's read through a couple of the questions here right off the bat uh, and see if there's anything that we can uh, talk about right at the beginning. Uh, first question was from Glenn. Uh, will Panasonic be releasing Pro as RAW for the S1? Unfortunately, we don't have any information regarding other cameras uh, and the future of ProRes RAW there. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you with that one. Uh, will Panasonic release an update so cameras can be used for webcams? Uh, I wish I had an answer for that one, um, but questions like that do get fed into our service team and support team, both here in the US, in the UK, and in Japan, uh, across, the, across the world. Uh, so, if something changes, we will be able to let you guys know. Uh, what's the next question we got here? Um, why not use DNG raw, uh, DNG format for raw? That's from Rob. Um, if you're talking about stills related, uh, DNG, it, obviously it's, an, it's a more open source raw platform. Um, ours is RW2 which uh, encloses a lot of our information for the camera and the way we work with it. Uh, kind of the same thing for most manufacturers. Different companies use different RAW files for their own uh, workflow with it. But given that most programs support uh, or very quickly support after launch uh, every individual manufacturer's RAW uh, file format, usually mitigates it. As far as video goes, um, my understanding is uh, obviously ProRes RAW being the more forward-thinking uh, platform uh, with given the fact that it's Apple ProRes. Uh, that was what our partners, uh, what Atomos was able to work with. So we were able to uh, work and build the process in with them. So uh, let's actually jump over now. It looks like uh, Matt is back online now. So with that, let's uh, jump over and get to this conversation going with Matt. 
That was embarrassing. Uh, hey, Matt, how are you? I just had to switch computers. I had to switch <laughs> computers to make this work. Um, yeah. Oh, man. Just so you know, we did test all this beforehand. It's not like we're total morons. This was literally <laughs> tested. But what I think happened is that I got shocked by the uh, Sean Robinson discotheque that I'm going to be in right now. I'm waiting for... I am waiting for his uh, disco ball to be added. I think that's an order now. Is that correct? Well, I mean, you know, come on, man. This is this is modern YouTube. You got to throw some accent lighting in the back. And figured with with the new apartment and new setup, might as well might as well have you look at something other than just the white wall in you know in my bedroom. <laughs> it's it's like Miami Vice or episodes of Narcos. The watching right now. This is pretty awesome. So, yeah. All right. Enough enough about our technical problems. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, just like we were saying at the at the launch of this, you know, a couple of the topics that we want to cover first and get them out of the way before we go into talking about Lumix G versus Lumix S, you know, is primarily about the some of the features in the version 2.0 firmware update. So let's start with the um, monitoring over HDMI for those that are using 4K, um, 5.4K, 5.9K, and 6K. Um, we know yeah, that so we've think- added this. Yeah. Yeah, so with the previous firmware on the S1H, um, if you were shooting those resolutions that are outside the standard, you know, our, our standard for HDMI would be up 4K at the time um, of the S1H's launch. Uh, when we get to 5.9K, 5.4K, those are not standardized resolutions for HDMI to carry. And so we weren't outputting that information. So we've developed a way to downscale the content. Um, Content's down res to a UHD output, so you're still getting UHD. You're just not getting the 5.9K uh, recording into the external monitor. But it's a great solution because we had people who wanted to use these new um, high-end anamorphic lenses that do the full sensor coverage yeah. and cover that entire you know, 24 by 36 millimeter sensor. And the minute they connected it and they were looking on their uh, client monitor, the minute they pressed record, this was going blank on them. So for them to be able to show clients what's going on in real time is a huge benefit to the to that firmware update. Yeah, and so, you know, I with everything that, that's been going on with me, at least for the last week, I haven't actually had a chance to dive into testing, you know, what it looks like. So if someone is shooting in 5.4 or 5.9K, which are all, uh, well, the which are already relatively normal-ish uh, aspect ratios, um, what happens when they connect it to the recorder? Are you getting, obviously you said you're getting that 16 by nine or UHD crop out of it. So people do need to be aware that, you know, you will, you are capturing more height on your actual camera versus the recorder, correct? Now, so, so, so the way this is gonna work is, so let's say we're in the 5.4K, you know, like a 60 by nine aspect ratio. It's just going to output that to your monitor, and so it'll fill the whole monitor screen. That shouldn't be a problem. If it's a uh, you know 17 by 9 aspect ratio, it'll give you little black bars at the top and bottom. We call those letterbox bars. They'll be there. The okay. real question is what happens with 6K, right? Because that's in a 3-2 aspect ratio. How is that displayed? Uh, there'll be what are called pillar box bars. There's black bars at the left and right of the screen, and you'll see the aspect ratio in the middle. So th- that's what you get. Now, keep okay. in mind that the camera is technically putting uh, 3840 by 2160 resolution, but those black bars at the left and right are taking up some of that resolution. So because they're taking up some of the resolution, remember, if you record it, you're not technically getting 3840 resolution captured. You're getting something around 2880 resolution for width. Um, and so you're, the actual captured resolution on the external recorder, if you decided to record, that would be about 2880 give or take okay yeah so so for those that are looking to utilize this as as a way to also backup record through the atomos while you're recording that 6k internally to be aware you are going to have a lower resolution record than technically the full uhd because of those black bars this way it fits in that uhd signal that the atomos uh, receives correct Right. Now, this, again, this only really affects, um, this really only affects the, six, the 6K the six mode, which is in 3-2 yeah. aspect ratio. The other aspect ratio is you're going to capture you know, 30 to 40 of width in your recording. Um, it's still not going to be 5K or 5.9K or 5.4K to the external recorder. 
because it has to be downscaled to fit within the HDMI standard, at least the standard that the S1H includes on its HDMI port. You know, maybe cool. someday down the road, we have to have a reason to buy more cameras. So down the road, <laughs> when there's an 8K camera, then we'll probably output 8K at some point. But uh, that's still a ways down the road. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and definitely hardware related, you know, with, with stuff like that as 8K comes out and, and that platform becomes more consumer ready. Yeah. Please, um, please no rumors post that we're doing an 8K update to the S1H. That is never <laughs> going to happen. This is, this is just us vamping about what the future could hold way down the line. Exactly, exactly. So with that um you know moving to that the the next main point that came with the uh firmware is there's a lot of people asking about why we decided to update the vlog profile with a new noise reduction level and why is it negative one instead of just making negative one zero um could you ex expand on that yeah it's called a reverse spinal tap instead of <laughs> turning it up to 11 we're turning it down to negative one um, so uh, my, my mom always taught me that, uh, if you're digging and you hit gold, you should stop digging. And the, the, the truth is, is that the S1H has already got received a, a claim for its image quality. And it's so well received that, you know, it's a part of the Netflix post-technology alliance. So it was approved as it sits today for those productions. So let's imagine for a minute that you're working on a big production. It, it doesn't have to be Netflix. It could be any production where you're working with an external colorist. And you decide to do a firmware update to your S1H. And all of a sudden, zero becomes much noisier. And you start submitting your files to your colorist now. And all of a sudden, they're having to add an additional step in post, adding some post-production noise reductions because their workflow was designed around the original specification of the S1H. And now you have changed that specification and your colorist is gonna have a nice little conversation with you about how this is adding additional workflow. And you know, heaven forbid if they're actually doing their noise reduction on cloud-based um, computing, they're now paying by the megabyte for those cloud computing cycles. The point I'm making here is that we can't disrupt the workflows of higher end productions by introducing a lower level of noise reduction into the camera. Uh, mm -hmm. The people who've been asking for this have primarily been um, less expensive productions. Things like, you know, wedding, wedding, wedding videographers love this addition to the camera. People who are doing music videos, they love this addition to the camera. Independent feature productions, where a lot of people are, are handling production and post production, they want more control over noise reduction for their workflow. And so in order for us not to disrupt certain productions, but to accommodate other production, it just made more sense for us to add a negative one. I hope, cool. I know it's a lot of words. I hope that explained it effectively. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, that's, that's perfect. You know, that, that there's a lot of thought process put into the entire ecosystem of who is using any of our cameras when, when they're, they're actually in production, whether that's, like you said, Netflix, um, you know, high-end cinema production, wedding videography production, even to the casual consumers production where, you know, you're just getting into it. Um, that uh, and something I want to point yep. out. So, sorry, mm -hmm. One other thing I want to point out. So we, we, we talked about the Netflix post-technology alliance. I, I just want to make it abundantly clear. This was not Netflix direction that they didn't want this done. In, in fact, we didn't even talk to them about this change, that this was something we did to help other styles of filmmakers. So this is not really a Netflix thing. This is making sure that we can fit within the production workflows of productions that are working with a first AC, second AC. They probably have a DIT on set and are working with an external colorist. We need to make sure that those workflows are not disrupted while we also accommodate workflows that are perhaps single shooter who's covering from production to post and deliverable. And that this correction really addresses that segment of the market more than just about anything else. Cool, cool, yeah. So uh, for those in the chat mentioning about the uh, audio volumes, um, we've been tweaking them up a little bit. Uh, if you're still hearing some audio level differences, uh, bear with us, we are making some changes while we're going through. Um, the start of this stream, like we said, has been a bit bit of a challenge with so many things changing at, at one bit. So we, we uh, 
appreciate you bearing with us on it here. Um, with that out of the way, um, the last thing, I, you know, as far as firmware updates go that I, I, I think we want to touch on a little bit here is obviously the bigger, no, uh, bigger uh, conversation, which was ProRes RAW, so RAW over HDMI, uh, being delayed for a little bit. Uh, you've worked very closely with, with the teams and been involved with, with what's going on with this. Uh, what can you share with us about, you know, what people should expect for now? So ultimately some last minute peccadillos were uncovered with the firmware that, um, you know, to, to be honest with you, the engineers are working through to get alleviated. Um, when working with a new firmware and you as your own company have total control over it, it's a lot easier than when we're working with three different companies and having to have it all tested and make sure that everything works correctly. So sometimes things are uncovered by one party that were not uncovered by another. Um, ultimately, this was really covered during the beta testing phase by filmmakers who were shooting with the product. So we, we know that, the, that there was a challenge that was there. Um, you know, no one's being, no one's going to really explain exactly what the challenge was, but we, we are, we're ultimately our goal here is to make sure that it's a product that we can be proud of and we know will create the fewest possible problems when it goes out. And so we ultimately decided it was better for the filmmaking community to just hold back a few weeks, make sure we get it right, and then send it out to the world when it's going to be its absolute best. And so that's what we did. Cool. Yeah. So obviously the, the last, the last thing that, um, obviously a number of people are commenting, uh, on the thread here. And we know that a lot of people have been commenting online about is obviously the, the SD card, um, update, the component of the firmware that addressed some of the issues that users were having with, uh, file, uh, recording. So right. with that, uh, Obviously, the update came out, uh, and already, if you look through a, a vast majority of users that were having previous challenges with certain brand SD cards, um, mm -hmm. seem to be, in general, corrected. Um, you're not having many issues as far as MDT files or corruptions there. Um, I know from working with a number of cards myself, working with different brands, different cards that we've been using, we have found that, you know, obviously some of the cards that I'm using that may have been causing an issue before are no longer causing issues anymore with the 2.0 firmware update. And in mm -hmm. situations where I have had cards that were continuing to cause some challenges, reaching out to the brand that manufactured it and reporting it to them, got a couple of my cards replaced, uh, namely uh, working with, uh, which was the one card that I recently did. Um, Begin with an L? Yeah, yeah, the the uh, and, Lexar and, cards and, that and, I've been using. and in the XR, yeah, Lexar. Yeah. yeah, the the new generation of their cards uh, seem to be working perfectly fine. The new generation of the Prograde Cobalt and I forget what the uh, I think it's Gold series. Um, mm -hmm. They're working perfectly fine in it. Um, so obviously, yes, the update was published. It addresses a huge portion of challenges there and. If there are continued challenges that some people may be having with the cards, you know, definitely check and make sure that the card is is current, that it's it's within the specifications that they say they are. And if you're still having a challenge, um, you know, you still do need to reach out to the manufacturer of that card to potentially work on getting a replacement for it. Because remember, the S1H, while a lot of people out there have been commenting, oh, well, you know, it worked fine in, a, in the GH or something like that. The S1H is pushing a ton more information and it's a, it's a different camera than the, S, uh, than the GH series. So anytime you have that variable and the vast majority of people that are reporting back that were having issues are no longer having the issues, you start whittling down through scientific process that the errors are coming from at that point, some of the memory cards and different variants of it. Um, yeah, I, I think yeah. I think what's important for people to understand is that um, Panasonic's always trying to enhance products. We're always trying to improve them. Um, we've already publicly stated that we've altered the way the S1H's buffer is being handled. 
in the S1H versus how it was previously, and that's the big part of the fix. You know, it's important to note that we can have the buffer to the specification of an SD card. And then ultimately the market can have cards that are not quite to the specification of the card. And when you cut the line that thin to where you're to the spec with your buffer, because you want to make sure that the camera is snappy and responsive, when cards are out of spec, it can create a challenge for us. And so it's possible for a company like Panasonic to say we were to spec, but we understand now what's happened in the market. So we're going to alter our firmware to make it more accommodating to cards. And that yeah. doesn't mean that you're still not going to run into issues. You know, the goal here is to prevent MDT errors or, or corrupt files from happening. You know, if your card is out of spec, the camera may still stop recording. And the goal is to make sure I can wrap the file so that you don't lose it. Um, if you're experiencing those type of endings to your recording, like abrupt endings, you should contact your memory card manufacturer. And we understand that this live stream is being viewed globally. It's not just being viewed here in the United States. Um, yeah. Sean and I live in the US. Uh, we're, more, uh, we're more keen to what's happening in our market. We know what's being said right now when you call specific memory card manufacturers, um, help desks in the United States. We know what they're saying about the problem. That doesn't necessarily mean that every other country is being communicated the same way about this issue. So again, I would urge you to, to check with your manufacturer and this will get easier to manage when we get past the COVID-19 issue because yeah. there are some memory card changes that are happening. It's just harder for you to get access to those cards right now because of the, because we just don't have cards in, in market right now. So yeah. again, I just wanna make sure everybody understands the first thing you should do is update the firmware and check to make sure it's working in your camera. And if your memory card's working, Bob's your uncle, you're ready to go. If, however, you're still experiencing these shutdowns, we would urge you to reach out to your memory card manufacturer and talk to them about the problem. And let them know specifically that you're getting MDT file errors with your Panasonic S1H. If you yeah. use that specific language, you have a higher probability of them understanding what's going on. Yeah, and and you know to to that point for for our our global viewers, you know, remember that yes, with all major companies, you know, you would think that communications are distributed incredibly fast, you know, that that every region should be on the same page at the exact same time, but in some cases things do take a little bit of time for information to disseminate through all of the channels involved. You know, all the different service channels, the chat channels, the online customer service channels, it, it takes a little bit of time for that information to come out. We've only had the firmware out for about a week, which means that you know testing has been going on and on and on. And even after we release a firmware, we don't just stop testing. We are continually listening. So as someone brings a question up to us about anything about the firmware, we are always testing it. We're always reporting back up through the different channels that you know are relevant for that, that product. So, I think that's enough on the SD card uh, conversation right now. Um, if you guys have more questions about that, obviously drop them in the chat. We'll do our best to answer what we can in the chat uh, and continue going on from there. Um, with that, let's let's move into kind of the, the core uh, and second portion of this stream uh, that we wanted to talk about. And that's, you know, looking at what Panasonic has as a platform now. Um, with a full frame camera in the S series. So we have our, our three cameras there. And we have the G series cameras. So we have the, the um, obviously GH, G9, G, the general G series GX. And what, what makes the, the point for someone to say, you know, from a, vid a videography standpoint, why would I pick an S1H over an S or a, a GH or vice versa? Um, Matt, since you're, uh, more video oriented than I am. Um, why why would someone pick an S1H over a GH5 and vice versa? Well, I think for the purposes of this conversation, it's probably not a good conversation to talk about like G85 or GX85. Because I, yeah. I, it's, it's difficult for me to imagine somebody saying, hey, should I buy a $600 camera or should I buy a $4,000 camera? That's not <laughs> a realistic comparison. What it really comes down to is probably professional applications, professional production, 
and what your needs are. So um, clearly an S1H has a significantly larger sensor. It's four times the size of what's in a GH5. Yeah, it's, I can't get past that physics. That's what it is. And <laughs> you have 20 megapixels on a GH5 or 24 megapixels on the S1H. Um, those pixels are going to be bigger. So better low light on the S1H and you're going to get a bit better dynamic range. That's why we're able to cover the full V-Log versus the V-Log L. Um, it's sensor dynamic range limitations of micro four thirds. So when we understand those things, you're going to have more latitude to work with with an S1H. You're going to have better low light sensitivity with an S1H. And because of its newer stock, you know, newer product, um, you know, faster autofocus system in it. It has our deep learning algorithms for autofocus tracking functionality. And then it has things we've learned over the years, like people want, you know, 120 frames that can actually record sound with a dedicated codec. So you get those enhancements that we've developed, you know, since the GH5 that you don't get in the GH5. You know, GH5 will give you 180 frames per second, but there's no autofocus and there's no sound recording. Uh, the GH5 can do 4K60, but it won't do a 10-bit 4K60 internal. So it makes, I've made the GH sound like a terrible camera you should never buy it. But the, <laughs> the, the truth is that I think the GH5 has a huge competitive advantage and that is its size. And we're not just talking about camera body size. We are talking about system size. You know, mirrorless cameras make small camera bodies. Micro Four Thirds makes a small camera system. Your optics will be smaller and lighter weight. Your access to Everything from micro four thirds to medium format lenses, all of them cover that circle. And then you can do things like speed boosting and focal reduction to get more gain out of the lens. So you can have higher, you know, higher native light that's coming into it. Um, so in, in that regard, I, I'm, a, I'm of the opinion that the, sorry, my uh, power light just came on my laptop. So I want to make sure I power some plug in there. Remember <laughs> earlier, earlier we had some technical difficulties and I had to switch to a laptop in an emergency and I need to give it some power. Um, so we're going to oh. do that just real quick. Um, hopefully you didn't lose me. Well, we, we just lost, lost your video there, Matt, for a moment. Um, Am I back? But we'll, we'll, uh, nope, not yet. We'll uh, come back in a minute with uh, Matt's video, okay. but yeah, yeah. You know, so, the, so I think yeah, yeah. I think the, the, the key here is that we need to understand that for lightweight operation, the GH series cameras are excellent for that. For you know the maximum image quality, that's where the G8, that's where the S series comes in, the S1H in particular. And then we also need to remember that we have faster readout speeds on the sensor on a GH. So for high speed things or things where you're worried about uh, rolling shutter problems the GH is going to be a much better camera at managing rolling shot. Yeah. So um, for those watching, um, we, we do have a technical issue with the, oh, okay, here we go. Matt just came back. So let's, uh, there we go. Matt's back. <laughs> Again, for everyone watching, we, 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 we apologize for some of the technical issues we're having on this stream. Um, We've we've had a good run so far without having any major technical issues, so it's always going to rear its head up eventually. Um, so, just like you were saying, Matt. Oh, there we go. So, aside from from some of those technical platforms, you know, like w with the size differences between the full frame S one H and the Micro Four Thirds uh, GH five. I'd imagine that that in general also supports major changes for people that want to do things with drone work versus heavy gimbal work versus studio setups. Um, mm -hmm. Like I know for a fact there's a number of automotive shows, which I won't mention by name, that were on the BBC and on, on Amazon Prime, that if you're watching the shows, you'll see that there were GH4s, GH5s, 5Ss used in car, uh, for in-car shots. Um, I'd imagine that's a that's a big advantage that you know if your application requires it, having a camera that's as capable as the GH line is for cinematic and production style work is a huge benefit compared to an S camera, which is just going to be heavier, larger, shallower depth of field, harder to work with. Um, not to yeah, mention think, less expensive. Yeah, I think in in the case of in the case of working with um, like drones, for example. Uh, there's definitely going to be a big difference where every ounce, you know, every gram you can save drone manufacturers just crave for those lighter weights. Um, you know, 
if you want to do a drone shot with an anamorphic lens and you're going to do it on a full frame camera, you're effectively going to need a heavy lifter. It's not going to be a simple drone shot for the most part. And that's where a GH5 can come in or a GH5S can come in and you can still use very compact, lightweight anamorphic optics with that camera and you can fit it on a standard drone. Um, you're substantially less expensive gimbal when you're working with a GH5S or a GH5 versus an S1H, just because the weight differences are so are so dramatic, especially because of the lens weights. So I think those things all make a lot of sense. But even for just basic run and gun work where you're shooting a documentary and you don't want to rig up a camera because you're in a war zone and you don't want to draw more attention to yourself than you already are, there certainly is advantages to shooting with that GH camera over the S series camera in those applications as well. So, you know, it's the best tool for the job that you're working. And oftentimes the S series is going to give you phenomenal, beautiful results, but it may not be the best tool all the time for each application. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you know, kind of in line with that, you know, from the photography perspective, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot that we can cover across the board when you talk about S versus G, but you know, even in, in the photography side of the industry, you know, with, with the launch of the new 20 to 60 millimeter lens, I, I think a lot of people are seeing kind of that, that convergence of focal lengths that you may not normally see in full frame that are influenced by what we can do in four thirds. So case in point, the 20 to 60 millimeter lens those that are fans of four thirds, you know, know that we have the 10 to 25 millimeter, which is an F 1.7. So having, having the advantage there where you look at a lens like that on four thirds and it's a, it's a bit larger of a lens in, in all honesty, but it's a superb optic. I mean, it's, it's, it's near reference quality, if not reference quality, being able to take some of the things that we've learned in four thirds and apply them into the full frame system, with that 20 to 60 and produce a small, compact, lightweight, good, solid travel lens for people means that the benefits of all the systems across the board for both photographers and videographers is, is more than you would have seen in, in previous generations of, of cameras in the market. And the reason yeah, I, I bring think, that up. I think you glossed yeah. over the lead there. Uh, we introduced a new lens called the 20 to 60 millimeter <laughs> F3556 <laughs> lens. And yeah. It's super awesome. I think you forgot to, you buried the lead a little bit there, but yes, that, <laughs> that lens is really pretty amazing. Um, and I want to yeah. make sure that people understand that uh, Sean smoothly segued in there and I want to make sure that you guys are really aware of how cool this lens is. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sean and I have known about this thing for a little while. Sometimes you have to play dumb. And uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, we have been chomping at the bit for this lens to be revealed to the world. We think, it, we think it's pretty amazing what, what our engineers have accomplished. Yeah, and, and, and that's what's kind of cool about, about the, the system in general, right? And, and when we have Suzette come in in a few minutes um, you know, to actually talk about her experiences with the lens, the, the coolest thing that, that I know I've taken from this lens being in the system, and, and I know Suzette mentioned this before, and we'll dive in about her experiences with it later, is that it's the perfect system where if you're a dual platform user, so you're someone like myself who has obviously all of our S series and all of our G series, you know, that the advantage of working for the company, when I go out and shoot, and I know when a lot of people go out and shoot, you may have multiple cameras with you and being able to have my wide to normal, you know, kind of mid tele range on my full frame camera for resolution and landscapes, but then use my, G9 with the 50 to 200 on there for my telephoto reach means that my kit is so small and compact across the board, like collective, ugh, collectively, that it's, it's showing why as a brand, we went four thirds and full frame and why we've commented that, you know, there isn't going to be an APS-C from, from Lumix, that we have that perfect mix of compact travel lightweight system with the pro size, you know, pro image quality, pro performance in the S series. And, you know, it, everything we do is designed to complement across the board, whether you're in S or in G series. So looking at it from a photographer's perspective, I have pretty much everything I need across the board. If I do want to travel completely light and not have to worry about 
you know, the, the big heavy bag that I'm going to carry with me. I can just carry my smaller backpack or day pack and carry my G9 with, you know, four or five lenses in there. If I'm going on a more professional gig where I know I'm going to want really, low, you know, high end, low light performance with ultra thin depth of field, because that's what the client's asking for, then I can bring my full frame camera and also still carry a G9 with me if I need to carry, you know, do some more low key street style shooting with it as well. So it ends up being a solid balance, I think, across the board for um, for people. Um, so I, I, I just want to touch base on one other aspect of this. Um, so for sports photojournalism, um, it's very common for the photojournalists to have to carry a couple cameras with them because they're going to want to have that 16 to 35 ish equivalent lens, you know, in this case, 20 to 60 for a wide, for wide, wide capture. Right. And then they're going to use a long lens for the action for the, the sport, whether it's football, basketball, whatever. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the cost to get a 400 millimeter F 28 on a full frame camera body, you know, it's a substantial investment versus a 200 millimeter F 28 on a G nine that gives you your 400 millimeter equivalency. And, you know, the micro four thirds camera may have some advantages in this case because depth of field equivalency becomes reversely beneficial at that point, because now I actually have a little more depth of field. So I'm getting more in focus shots with that camera and that's beneficial with in, in this particular instance. So, you know, yeah. for sports journalism, it may be beneficial to look at this mix as, your, your potential solution use an s series camera for your wides and this, for your wide shots that are up close um and then you can still use your g9 camera that you've already invested in as your long telephoto camera and i feel like we've totally yeah. stolen a ton of suzette's thunder when we've discussed this right now but um <laughs> no, you know but in, the, in the in that i think you're 100 percent right yeah and, and you know for for like myself too you know I, 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 I ride a motorcycle and a lot of times I don't necessarily want to carry, you know, if, if I'm going downtown, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily carry my big heavier backpack with my S series cameras since it's a motorcycle. It has to look, you know, a little bit less storage than a car does. And I don't really have any place that I can put stuff. So having both systems there means that I don't have to compromise on most importantly to me, my, my muscle memory on how I'm actually using my camera. I don't have to retrain myself to say, you know, I wanted to get a smaller camera, so I went with a compact, but now, you know, how quickly can I change ISO and shutter speed and, and things like that? When I carry my G9 with me and the 15 millimeter Sumalux that I use, that immediately is just a comfortable camera to use. And it's compact enough that it doesn't make a difference if I have to carry the thing around all afternoon. If I decide, you know, eh, you know I'm kind of not feeling it today. I'm not really feeling like going out and shooting. So I can just sling it over my shoulder. It's low, it's lightweight, doesn't, doesn't impact my day-to-day -day life. Where an S-Series and any full-frame camera for that matter, just because of physics with larger optics, they are gonna be a little more intrusive for casual shooting. So it makes a great benefit for those that want to have a solid balance of system across the board without giving up you know, the, the comfort that you have when you shoot by having to learn extra systems there. And, Across the board, everything that we make, you know, it's either going to be like a certified or it's like a branded, like you'll see from the systems in G versus S, and they're all premium quality optics. And that that goes equally for the new 20 to 60 millimeter. I mean, this thing, um, like I said, we're going to have Suzette come in in a minute here, and and talk about her experiences with it. But this lens is insane. I know a lot of people are talking about. Uh, online, you know, that it, it, it's a variable aperture, which yes, it is. And, you know, having to balance the design between going fast aperture for a full frame lens and trying to minimize size and weight on it, they, they don't play well together, that combination. You either have really fast optics that are big and, and ultra premium, or you have lenses that are compact, but still ultra high image quality because of modern optic design techniques. And with all the well, technology think, we put in these things, you don't run into issues with variable apertures like we used to 10 years ago. Well, I think we're in an ISO 12,800 world now, right? Um, yeah. Where, you know, a decade ago, we were in an ISO 400 to 800 world. And so the, the need for bright lenses 
is less important today as it was 10 years ago. And brightness is now, you know, light gathering is now just as much a creative tool as it is a ISO, you know, suppression tool. So I, yeah, you have to remember it's a $600 lens. So we, yeah. we, we hit a $600 price point giving you a wide, an ultra wide 20 mil all the way out to 60 millimeters. That 20 mil is F3.5. Um, it's hard to complain about a lens that's 600 bucks that covers a full frame sensor image circle that gives you a wide and also gives you zoom. So it's a very flexible lens and we think it's going to be very popular. I think the initial commentary is, is, is very positive on the lens. Yeah. And, and to that point, I think with, with a lot of people, what, what you want to look at as the, you know, for the system as a whole is that yes, the S series is designed as a, as a, professional level product you know it's designed to be premium but that doesn't mean that you know we can't come out with lenses that are obviously more cost conscious uh, conscious so users that want to get into the system but aren't sure you know do you want a 24 to 105 do you want 24 to 70 70 to 250 mil you want something that's got a good you know the level image quality that we're we're targeting on the entire S series, but you want something that you can travel with and actually enjoy using is, is a big thing. And in my time shooting with it, I've not run into a single situation where I've been upset about image quality at all on this lens. I know you've been shooting with it for a little bit too. Um, what are, what are your thoughts so far? Well, I think the first thing that caught my eye is the weight. It's so small and compact. Um, you know, my go-to lens on a G-series camera has been the 12-60, to and this is in the range of the size of 12-60. to And um, you and I have wildly different opinions on how much weight we want to carry around with us. Uh, <laughs> you are, you have that machismo that makes you want to carry around the biggest, baddest camera. Um, I, on the other hand, prefer a stealthier, more mm -hmm. sleek uh, let's just call it what it is. I'm weak and I don't want to carry around a heavy camera. So yeah. adding that lens to the system uh, has really changed my enjoyment using the S1. So I, I found that lens to be, um, it, it has really helped me to use the camera in more situations. You know, the best camera yeah. is the one you ultimately have with you. And that lens means I'll carry the S1 with me a lot more often. Exactly. So um, for those that are on the stream, uh, I want to introduce uh, Suzette Allen. Uh, she is one of our Lumix ambassadors here in the United States. Uh, and she's gonna uh, continue the conversation with us on the 20 to 60 millimeter lens. But before we jump into that, uh, how's it going, Suzette? It's going great. Yeah. Awesome. I am so happy um, to be on here and sharing about the lens. I've loved it. Nice. So for, for those that, um, uh, either aren't, aren't around in the California area to, to see one of your seminars. Can you give us a little history, um, you know, who you are, uh, what got you into photography, and then, um, you know, any projects that you're working on now? Yeah. Um, actually, I've been a photographer for way longer than I want to admit. Let's say it's well over 20 years. <laughs> Anyway, um, I love people, I love portraiture, and I've made a living as a portrait photographer most of that time. Um, I still do portraiture and I do high-end weddings also down in the LA area. And I love to travel and teach. And so I've been doing lots more landscape and flowers and doing coffee table books and that kind of thing. I'm just a total photomaniac, I have to admit it. Um, and it's been <laughs> wonderful to be a Lumix ambassador. Oh so many great tools and toys and um it's just really cool and i have really enjoyed the s1 now i love the g series because it's nice and light and i don't want to carry a bunch of gear but uh, the s1 the image quality is incredible and now with this new lightweight lens it's awesome anyway um let's see visual <laughs> storytelling is really at the core of what i like to do and more and more, I want to travel and um, not carry a ton of gear. So um, just this whole scenario has worked out really well for me. Cool, cool. So, so right along those lines, um, when, when it came time for this lens to need 
you know, obviously sample images so we can demonstrate the image quality of the lens, uh, you know, through a professional photographer who's, you know, uh, acclaimed in the U.S. and, and with our mm -hmm. team and highly respected, you know, how, how, how did the project go for you? Um, you know, what, what were some of your experiences shooting with, with this new lens? Actually, um, I got the lens about six weeks ago and it was right in the middle of the lockdown. So couldn't really go anywhere, but I still managed to do a lot of photography. Um, of course, I'm a total flower freak. And uh, so, and I have lots of flowers in my yard and it's like early spring here in California. So um, <laughs> took tons and tons of images. I was out of control, but it was really fun. Uh, I did do a road trip to Oregon. I'll show you some of my images. Man, it is awesome for landscapes as well. And I'm really a wide angle girl. Um, I prefer wide angle more than a longer lens, um, but yeah, it's been really fun shooting that lens. And I've even taken it on some portrait sessions and it is the most versatile lens and nice and small. It's perfect. Nice. So uh, talking about the sides of the lens, I know um, you, you have one of them there with you. Uh, compared to the 16 to 35 and say the 24 to 105, um, how, 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 how's the size look compared to them? Um, if well, you have I have them, them, are you able to show I have them right here. Perfect. So here is the 30, the 16 to 35 compared to the 20 to 60. There you cool. go. Yeah. And then we have the 24 to 105, considerably smaller. Hey, yeah, Suzette, can that's... you turn them, can you turn them so we can see the lenses so you can see a dip, how much bigger round that they are like as well that? yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's quite a bit quite a bit smaller yeah so you had mentioned that you did some flower photography with your first sort of foray with it um yeah what do you think about its close focus distance was it was it oh it's amazing reasonable? it'll it'll focus like less than six inches away like five and a half inches so i was able to get almost macro shots and still with a wide angle um, you know, I'm, I forgot to mention when I was describing some of the projects that I do, um, I did this book. I'm a total flower freak, I told you. This book, um, probably eight or ten years ago, and it's all um, quotes and flower images. And I am doing a new one like this with Volumix. So I've been building content with that. So that's kind of been my pet project. So I have tons of macro shots and beautiful flower shots. and. The beauty of having that ability or capability in a lens that has this wide angle is perfect for storytelling because you get the macro close up of the beauty and the, um, the detail, but it shows the environment. So it's very much of a storytelling kind of image and it gives you lots of space. If you're a marketer, graphic designer or illustrator, then you've got the space for text and so it's been a really good storytelling kind of lens and I've actually enjoyed it a lot. Plus carrying one lens as opposed to both of these, it's just so much simpler. It's not quite as wide as this and it's not quite as long as this, but it's like a fraction of the weight and just it's it's been really good. I'll show you some of the images I got. They're awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so so going between the two, you know, when it comes from a, a technical perspective, like with sharpness and things like that, did you feel that going to this lens gave any loss in sharpness or quality compared to the sixteen thirty five or twenty four to one hundred five? I didn't see any loss. I was just blown away at how sharp it it was, especially at close range. I was super happy, and the bouquet is beautiful. So it's got that gorgeous depth of field. And, uh, you know, people complain about the 3.5 to 5.6, but the other two lenses are fours. And this is like that and a little bit more. It's not an issue. I'm, I'm really happy with it. And for 600 bucks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with um, during the beginning of it, you know, uh, both Matt and I were talking about, you know, that we, we live in an era now where camera quality, so the actual image quality that the cameras themselves captured, uh, regardless of the optic you're putting in front of it, has improved so much over the yeah. over the last number of years that the 
older way of thinking about you know variable aperture lenses really for some yes it is important and and i don't want to minimize those that do require fast aperture lenses but for the vast majority of people variable aperture lenses really kind of don't deserve the stigma that they've had over the previous number of years between optic designs that have gotten infinitely better than they were years ago to you know better mm -hmm. materials that they're being made of you know mitigates yeah. that thought that years ago a kit lens or a variable aperture lens was always thought of as a low quality lens where right. on these new right. ones I, like as you said you're not giving up sharpness and image quality right you're just moving to a variable aperture and there's tech we build into these lenses now nowadays anyway that for video users mitigates that you know the the mm -hmm. seamless iris the uh, attention to detail for focus breathing for the video users it, it, some of it i think is is a big point of you know get the camera in your it, yeah, get the camera in your hands get the lens in you know in, in your hands and put it on a camera and, and try it um you may be pleasantly surprised um mm -hmm. With that, you, um, there were some images uh, that that you had mentioned that you wanted to share. Um, let's uh, let's let's take a look at some of those uh, images you shot. Okay. Yeah, I um, spent a lot of time building all the sample images for the launch yesterday, and uh, just for the lens. So let me share my um, screen, and I'm just going to flip over here to Bridge, and show you some of my images. All right, so um, right after I got the lens, I went to Oregon and I got my brother's car. He loaned it to me for the summer. That's a nice little Magnum. I really loved it, but it was a <laughs> gorgeous drive. It was like a five hour drive and I took about 10 hours to do it. And I stopped everywhere and I photographed. Look at Mount Shasta. That was so amazing. And um, the wide angle, I was able to get some really cool stuff like this with the wide angle. And it's just a workhorse for the landscape. Now, this was uh, a burn area across the highway and the light was just playing on the hill so beautiful. And look how sharp that is. So the 60 millimeter allows you to zoom out a little bit, makes, makes it really easy. Oh, and then I came upon this marina. Now I drove down to shoot down by the water. Of course it's closed. They wouldn't let me in at all because of COVID. <laughs> So I had to shoot from up on the hill, but I still got a great shot. Uh, this one's cropped in a little skinnier because, you know, crop out the extra stuff. It was just gorgeous. And of course, I love wide angle, definitely wide angle girl. That's the river near my brother's house. So beautiful. <laughs> now this is the kind of stuff I like doing. I like doing like the macro shots and look how it really shows the detail of the pine cone, but it shows the environment. It's more storytelling. Same here all the moss and everything, but it shows the silhouette of the tree behind it also gives it a nice back, uh, background, but that gives it time and place where it's at. So um, really enjoy that. Oh, the little town near, near there, what, gorgeous old building. Of course, I'm always attracted to textures and stuff like this. So um, just the dynamic look of the wide angle is beautiful, but there's really hardly any distortion. And uh, I was able to get in really close to this old garage door and the paint, oh my gosh, all this paint was peeling or dripping or whatever it is, so cool. <laughs> and then and you can get right in there with the detail on the macro. Yeah. What were you, For... you going to say? For those that are um, that are in the chat, the images that we're looking at right now are captured by Suzette Allen here, uh, our Lumix ambassador here in the United States. Uh, these are taken with the brand new 20 to 60 millimeter lens that we just released uh, yesterday, right? Yeah, y yesterday. Yeah. Um, to to date this live stream for the future. Um, so for those asking, is it 1260? No, it's the 20 to 60 millimeter. So. Did Sorry I say 1260? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's, there's a, a lot of people in chat asking, you know, which lens was were these taken with, but uh, yeah. Oh, okay, got it. So the ability to zoom in on these tiny details, so crisp, I just love it. So right near that building was the river, and what a gorgeous day, right? So this is your typical kind of 50 millimeter view. It's nice, but that is so much more dynamic. 
and being able to have the rocks in the foreground anchors it and gives it just so much depth. I love it. So, so um, this, Suzette, we're, yeah. there's, there's a couple questions in the chat about the images that you're showing. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in, in the images you're showing, are, are you doing po like heavy post-processing to these or, or what, what, um, what, what process did you do for these images? I did a little bit of Lightroom. Um, in, cool. in this one, um, I did brighten up the shadows just a little bit because it was pretty wide dynamic range from the shadows to those white fluffy clouds. Cool. But um, yeah, a little bit of Lightroom on everything. So here's this ugly bridge. And I loved all the um, pussy willows blooming, but this is what is amazing about this lens. The ability to get in here at this detail and see it that sharp. I'm focusing super close and look at all the bouquet behind of all the uh, other little pussy willows in the light. It's just, this is like an emotional image of spring. And I just love the way this lens behaves. And all, all of these are the same lens. Um, again, yeah. storytelling, super detail and wide angle shows where you are and what you're doing. Now, um, uh, well, I'll just go next. Um, okay, so I did a, a um, high school senior session and the mom said, yeah, I want to photograph them at the city center in El Dorado Hills. I've never been there. So at sunrise, <laughs> 630 in the morning. So it's like I took a drive and just grabbed that camera and this lens and uh, didn't even bring a tripod and oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. So of course I got some nice landscapes and this is the little bridge. So I'm right up here on the top of the bridge um, shooting. I did a bunch of flowers. This was on top of the bridge up there. So it had rained the night before. And so all the flowers and leaves were covered with dew or raindrops and this is that scene right there. The flowers are right there in the lower corner. And both of those are from the same place. Now, fortunately, the, the fountain wasn't going. You can see the little fountain thing there. So we got this mirror image on the water. But um, the ability to get both of those views from the same spot is amazing. Because I'm shooting over that rail. That rail is like chest high. So I can't get any yeah. closer. Here, here's where I'm shooting from, shooting down. And... So there is the 20 millimeter wide angle with the sky in the water and that is zoomed in on that flower. So from that to that, from the same spot, I'm, I'm hanging my arms over the, over the, um, the railing. I can't get any closer. So cool. the versatility is just amazing. And the clarity, how gorgeous is that? <laughs> I um, think the, another... oh, there it goes, cool. Say that again? Oh, no, no, you're good. Oh, okay. Another detail and wide of the same, uh, the same tree. Um, now, there, I have to admit, there were times that I wished it was longer and I couldn't get that close. <laughs> so these are some little weeds nearby, uh, near the road. And this little flower is only about a half or three quarters of an inch. But I cropped in and look at how crisp and gorgeous this is. So because I'm using the full frame, I can just crop in if I need to get closer. So it works. That's just so beautiful. Thanks. So here are some um, more. These are for my uh, project for my flowers. And having the wide angle gives me lots of space to do graphics. And the clarity. These little flowers are quarter inch. They're so, so tiny. And so the ability to focus really close, I love. And you can see the quality is there. Yeah. So is that, are you hand holding most of these shots then? All the ones with the raindrops, I was hand holding, yes, um, because I didn't even take my tripod. I what about those I had... small flowers? What about the small flower ones that oh, you just these? showed? Yes, these are like on my, right out in front of my house on the uh, road. So yeah, these are handheld. Okay. And these are in my front porch. So yeah, these are handheld too. Yep. Yeah, and that's 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 such a cool thing with you know the the other thing with the the twenty to sixty being the fact that it's not an optically stabilized lens where the entire S series is sensor stabilized means that for photographers you're not losing any any 
benefit of stabilization for hand holding with something like this. You're actually getting, you know, in, in some respects, a better benefit because it's it gets to be smaller, lighter, you know, more compact. The bodies take care of the stabilization for you, so you're not losing any any issues there. And the whole kit in general weighs less than what you would normally be using with 24 to 105, marginally less than the 16 to 35. Right. Yeah. With a lot more reach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With 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 a lot more reach. <laughs> Awesome. So um, this this is another comparison. This is super wide and closer and closer and closest. All those with the same lens and just changing my perspective. So it's such a great story telling lens. Now, these are my favorites and these are the ones that Lumix chose to do some of their ads for the lens. Um, and the ability to focus in this detail um, I end up using manual focus and use focus peaking. So there is absolutely no doubt that those little um, flower parts, what are they? The stamen? <laughs> I, I, I never remember which one's which. Anyway, um, totally impressed with this lens. Oh my gosh, I had so much fun just getting these amazing uh, images. And these are handheld. These are on my mom's back porch. <laughs> nice. Amazing, yeah. So uh, can you tell I'm a flower freak just a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> but the textures and the sharpness, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, did a bunch of fruit stuff too, and just had a ball with this. Now, oh yeah, let's, I'm gonna show you these, these two. These are handheld and look how sharp and crisp the water drops are just amazing. All right, so this is from the portrait session. I did a, a model shoot of this young man. So three quarter length looks great. I love the wide angle for some kind of stylized stuff. And um, then I also did a little bit of architecture and there's no distortion, love these. Um, obviously I do like wide angle. And I even did some like head and shoulders. Of course it's a little wide, you know, it, it has more of an editorial style. Um, <laughs> What I find, oh, let me go back. What I find is um, like when I'm shooting weddings, um, actually, let me just go back um, and unshare. Here we go. Okay, I'm back. Cool. So when I'm shooting um, weddings and also whenever I did the portrait shoot, I used the S1 for the main images, but I really want a long lens. So what I end up, Bringing is my uh, G9. This is actually the GH5 body because I'm shooting, I'm filming with the G9. But this is the 50 to 200. So this is a 100 to 400 millimeter equivalent. So I put this on a spider on my hip and I have the S1 and this. And between the two, this is like 400 millimeters. And look how small it is. It's so I have the best of both worlds. I carry that full range and not a lot of weight. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, a couple of the questions that we've had um, in the chat that uh, I'm seeing here. Uh, Cliff is asking, so in video, does this lens land or stair step on third stops as it opens and closes or is it smooth ramping like a camcorder's aperture? Um, Matt, you can, uh, I, I know you've, you've played around more on the video side with it. You want to dump that one on my lap? Thank you for that. Um, so let's, I've shot let's some be, with it, but... Let, let's be clear. If you're going to be manually controlling the lens on your own, you will have third stop increments in the camera. That's how it'll be adjusted. However, if you put the camera into shutter priority so that you set your shutter speed to where you want it and you allow the camera to expose for you, then it will have a continuously variable iris. So it just depends on how you have the camera set up. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, you know, for, for users, you know, if, if shutter, you know, the shutter speed's a priority there and you know you're gonna be moving in and out of, say, a dark environment if you're doing, say, real estate work. If you're moving between rooms that, say, are dark and, you know, window lit, different situations, shutter priority to make sure that your cadence looks right as you move through, you get a beautiful bloom as the aperture changes automatically for you. 
Yeah. Um, and, I'll, and I'll do that also with the ISO because you can set your low and high ISO points for auto ISO. So if you have to go from an extreme situation, which is nearly impossible in most camera situations, where you got to go from outside to inside, you can allow mm -hmm. that iris to roll and then the ISO to lift when you get inside. So it really works well in that regard. And I did test it with this camera. With, with that lens, it works really well. Yeah. So um, with that, we've, we've come up on a little bit little over an hour on this stream. So um, it's pretty much, uh, you know, kind of the, the time for us to wrap this up. Um, I want to thank uh, Suzette and Matt for joining us today uh, on this stream. Uh, again, obviously, we had some technical difficulties at the beginning, but we seem like we've got those ironed out, uh, you know, through the stream. So I appreciate everyone's patience with us on uh, today's live stream. Uh, for anyone that wants to follow and check out some of these images that, you know, this way they're not on YouTube streaming compression, uh, you can find them on the Lumix channels, but then also Suzette, where can, uh, everyone find your work, um, to see more, more examples. My website is suzetteallen.com and I'm actually finishing up a blog today, um, on the images and the lens. So I'll post that on my blog, which is suzettesays.com. And, um, on Facebook and Instagram, it's Suzette Allen. Cool. I lucked out with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, like I said, I want to thank everyone again for, for joining us here. As a reminder, uh, we go live with these events every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure that you're subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking the bell icon to get notifications for when we go live next. Uh, with that, we will see everybody on next week's stream. Thanks for joining.